All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Dr. Leo Trezande is an NYU professor, director of the Division of Environmental Pediatrics, and the vice chair for research in the Department of Pediatrics at the NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Leo is an internationally renowned leader in environmental health. His research focuses on the impacts of chemicals on hormones in our bodies. He's also led the way in documenting the economic costs for policymakers of failing to prevent disease of environmental origin proactively. He is also the author of the phenomenally successful book, Sicker, Fatter, Poorer. And if you're listening, you should head to Amazon right now and order it. I loved every single page. And because we share the same literary agent, I was introduced to his work early. I've always been concerned about endocrine disrupting chemicals, but after reading his book, I'm even more aware and cautious about protecting Sebastian. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Trezande to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh my goodness. I have been looking forward to this. I know that you are on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. I really wanted it to be in person. So when I heard that you were coming out to USC for a conference, fight on Trojans, I was just thrilled and willing to make it work. And I appreciate you willing being willing to make it work as well. We are my sitting My pleasure. Yeah, we're we're sitting in a um a ballroom of the LA Athletic Club downtown before his conference starts today. So showed up a little bit early, but we are raring to go. So without further ado, let's let's get going. If you don't mind, I'd love for you to to explain what the endocrine system is so that people have like a base knowledge of of what we're going to get into. Our body is complicated in that we use a whole bunch of signaling molecules called hormones that basically underlie all bodily functions from maintaining healthy body temperature, healthy weight, metabolism, salt, sugar, even sex. And what I study is the impact of synthetic chemicals that mimic or disrupt those hormones and contribute to disease and disability. We know of about 1,000 synthetic chemicals that do that. The evidence is strongest for four categories of chemicals, flame retardants used in electronics and carpeting, pesticides used in agriculture, bisphenols used in aluminum can linings and thermal paper receipts, and phthalates, which are used in personal care products, cosmetics, and food packaging. Wow. How many chemicals, synthetic chemicals, are there out there on the market? This number is a bit of a moving target. It's a scary number. Whatever number you use, if you use the lowest number, it's 30,000 synthetic chemicals that are out there. The estimates run as high as 300,000 most recently. But let's not get overwhelmed. There are 
priority chemicals, things that are the most prevalent in our daily lives, the things that we can attack and reduce in our daily exposure, and they can have the biggest impact. So let's get into that because I definitely want the positive takeaways. You share so much information in your book and and I think it has a positive spin. I really appreciated that. I think there's a lot of fear mongering out there. But let's go through bucket by bucket of the four biggest areas that we can clean up in our life, starting with fire retardants. So how can someone clean out the fire retardants in their house? So some of the steps are super simple. Simply opening the window can recirculate the air. These are chemicals that have been sprayed into upholstery from roughly 1975 to about 2013. No offense to California. It was a California law that required the flame retardants be added. It was, Of course it was. It was met with good intentions because people were smoking. Smoking <sighs> was causing fires right. and killing people. Right. But um, unfortunately, the flame retardants didn't slow the spread of fires and ultimately affected the developing brains of kids by uh, disrupting thyroid hormone, which is basically the growth hormone for the brain of kids uh, in pregnancy and in childhood. So let's get back to the easier stuff uh, to do. So recirculating the air in the home gets rid of some of these uh, persistent organic pollutants, not just flame retardants, but other chemicals that deposit in the dust. And yes, outdoor air is not free of pollution, but uh, even a couple of hours of recirculating that air gets rid of these flame retardants and the outdoor air has much lower amounts. Also, just using a wet mop is a simple way to sop up those dusts and uh, clean uh, the environment, especially where little babies are playing close to the floor. On the floor all the time, tummy time. Oh, yeah. So, well, I know that Swiffer chemicals are horrible. But my husband loves a dry mop. So I guess I have to get him on board with a wet mop. Yeah, there are some... Using a vinegar base or something of that nature. Yeah, um, vinegar is quite effective. Um, there are a variety of companies that are doing the right thing and also offering alternatives and really screening out chemicals of concern. The uh, It's not that everything natural is necessarily safe. <laughs> But compared to some of the synthetic chemicals out there, we have had things like vinegar um, and even bleach for some of the more resistant stains for hundreds of years now. And they've worked quite well. And there's not necessarily a benefit by adding a complicated carbon-based molecule to the mix. Got it. Cool. So can you tell me a little bit about fire retardant um, upholstery because something that was important to me when we purchased our car seat, for example, was we purchased a fire retardant free car seat for Sebastian because we knew he'd be spending a lot of time in the car traveling between LA and Orange County to see his grandparents and up to the mountains. Um, are Is it required to have fire retardant in upholstery still? It was until recently as California rolled back the law and required disclosure of flame retardant on the label. Yay, California, in that respect, setting the, okay. the table for the nation, doing the right thing, even if it didn't do the right thing before. Um, you can actually literally lift up a piece of furniture. And if you look at the label and it says no fl flame retardant added, you're good to go. And the same is true for uh, these. Um, other places where with good intention for many years, we thought it was the right thing to uh, spray and keep the spread of fires and try to uh, save kids' lives. Okay. So are there any places where we will always have fire retardants like in upholstery and vehicles or anything like that? Carpets? Something we should really look out for? For all, I'm not suggesting that you throw out furniture first and foremost. Okay. Okay. Um, even if you've welcome had to it our there, apartment. Yeah, it's a wood floor. Have a seat. <laughs> there you go. That said, if there are tears or, or or disruption of the protective outer coating, that's the fastest pathway for these chemical dusts to resorb out onto the floor and into our lives in a much more proactive way. So the right thing to do at that point is maybe phase that uh, piece of furniture out or at least cover it with a cloth or other protective coating to keep the dust from uh, settling into the home and staying in the, in the furniture instead. Got it. Okay. And so 
What about the inside of cars? Is, are there always fire retardants there? There, there could be. Okay. They're, they're sprayed for, again, depends on when the car was produced. Mm -hmm. There are some situations where you need it for other reasons. After all, there's a lot of electrical equipment there. Right. I tend to focus on the places where you're spending the most, most time, time. Mm -hmm. and um, sweating those details as opposed to the others. Um, I'm not suggesting people trade in their cars. Okay. That's, that's just, that's going a little too far. Yeah, of course. I'm just thinking if you can air out your family room, can you air out your vehicle right when you buy it? Absolutely. Park it in the driveway, open the doors. That new car smell is my least favorite thing. Now, that's not flame retardants. Those are other uh, synthetic chemicals that are meant to turn on the nostrils and give you a feeling like you just entered a paradise. But unfortunately, that gives me a headache. Right. There are people who are sensitized by that, uh, who get allergic symptoms, not to mention the other consequences associated with that new car smell. Got it. Okay. So we got fire retardants. What's up next? So let's talk about plastics. Okay. Uh, you know, we're used to having it in our daily lives. It goes back to the graduate. Um, and essentially, I'm not suggesting that we go back to the 1600s in the way we uh, eat, live. I have kids who, who are going to, to school uh, these days and um, you can't have things breaking at random moments, right? But simply not microwaving plastics is an important first step. Why? Well, it says microwave safe after all. But the reality is that microwave safe is only for gross misshaping or warping of the plastic. Whereas at a microscopic level, there's breakdown of that outer laying, uh, uh, outer layer rather. And um, plastic is a polymer, a chain of these carbon-based molecules. And when you heat them, you break off them one by one and then ultimately they get into the food. And then there are some non-covalently bounded additives. These are chemicals at, that aren't stuck to the material and they leach off, as, especially with heat. So for all those reasons, definitely don't microwave plastic. If you get something in a plastic container and you need to heat it, I take it out, put it in a glass container or something um, that can be microwaved appropriately without breaking and do it that way instead. And the same, unfortunately, goes for machine dishwashing plastic containers. That heat and that detergent wears down the outer layer. And if it's obviously etched or scratched, it's time to throw it away because whatever protective layer you're hoping on is just gone. Also, just look at the recycling number on a, a bottom of a plastic bottle. So the numbers three, six, and seven in that three arrow triangle yeah. are the ones to avoid. Looks like the recycling triangle and then it has a little number inside. Right. So three is for phthalates, uh, chemicals that literally make plastics softer. They uh, mess with your metabolism. They also, for the guys out there listening, um, they uh, mess with testosterone, the male sex hormone, which is important for everything from sperm count to potency to even metabolism. And it's actually literally sometimes a life or death matter because low T or low testosterone is a marker for or predictor of adult cardiovascular disease and stroke. Wow. So I don't mean to get depressing, but it's important. Yeah. And preventable. You can hammer it home and then give people the positive, the positive uh, life changes they can make. Exactly. Okay. So six is styrene, a known carcinogen. And seven are bisphenols, chemicals that mimic estrogen. Um, and activate estrogen and have a bunch of consequences, including metabolism as well. So can we talk a little bit about estrogen mimicking chemicals and how that works and how that would affect someone's estrogen levels internally in their body and their life? Yes. So chemicals can uh, mimic estrogen directly and activate uh, parts of our body. Uh, these are signals after all. And if the signal gets to the right place in the body, certain cells turn on, start manufacturing other materials and other things happen. And you get this cascade or domino effect. But it doesn't necessarily even have to mimic the chemical structure. That's what's scary, frankly, about the science these days. You can actually go right to the genome and it's not changing the genes, the A, C, G, and T lettering coding system. It's actually 
uh, changing how certain genes are expressed. There's this whole science of epigenetics. Don't mean to nerd out here, but I want you to. That's there why you're you go. Here. Okay, so uh, when you turn these uh, genes on or off, uh, you can literally have permanent lifelong consequences as a result of that exposure uh, to a synthetic chemical that literally turns the thermostat um, of the body one way or the other, for example. So when there are links from links to breast cancer with plastic bottles, what what's happening there? So estrogen is a signaling molecule for uh, breast cells to grow naturally. And uh, with time, there are uh, certain cells that change their form and they either respond to estrogen or don't respond to estrogen. And when you have uncontrolled growth, and that's breast cancer essentially in this case, you have certain receptors that stay around and they're highly responsive to that estrogen. So if you estrogen in the form of a synthetic estrogen or in the form of a synthetic chemical that happens to mimic estrogen, you actually t- continue and accelerate that overproduction of cells that can literally contribute to the development of worsening of cancer. And are there other cancers related to estrogen that women should be worried about? There or are aware of. Yes. So there are, um, you know, the endometrial lining, the entire female reproductive tract, the ovary is particularly sensitive to synthetic estrogens. Um, one of the classical synthetic estrogens, a chemical called bisphenol A or BPA, the ovary is exquisitely sensitive uh, to with a host of consequences, not just cancers, but reproductive dysfunctions and potential. Infertility. Indeed. Mm-hmm. And uh, bisphenol is not the only culprit in that respect uh, right now, based on what we know. So let's talk a little bit about that because everyone's touting BPA-free, but there are so many sister chemicals that act exactly the same. Is that correct? You say it so nicely, calling them sister chemicals. (laughs) I call them, well, I like how I call them. I call them the artist formerly known as BPA. (laughs) That's pretty funny. Yeah, the 40 or so. Uh, So there's BPS, BPF, BPP, BPZ. And um, this is a, a game the chemical industry plays, quite frankly, when they realize that the heat's coming into BPA, quite literally, and they need to change because of potential bans or other unsavory issues like lawsuits and what have you. They'll change their manufacturing methods and literally substitute a carbon in the molecule for sulfur. That's literally what BPA does when you switch to BPS. Unfortunately, what little we know about BPS is it's as estrogenic, as toxic to embryos, and as persistent to the environment. And so you put that combination together, you're literally whacking the mole and uh, kicking the issue down and giving people, frankly, a false sense of security that BPA-free is free of the health effects. I would ideally like to see bisphenol-free. That's why I suggest families avoid canned food consumption if they can across the board. There are certain companies that have really been extremely proactive and they say they're based on oleoresin, which is a naturally derived lining. It's not proven to be safe, but to me that's superior and there's always glass. Okay, so let's get to that because that was a really good nugget of information that people should be aware of. What can we pull from our lives and what are we replacing those things with to pull out the BPA. And before we move on to that, what number are they looking for in that recycle triangle? So, And is that just for BPA or BPS as well? That's for all the bisphenols. Now, unfortunately, that convicts, if you will, a few chemicals that are not problematic. However, there's just no way to tell. So I take the approach of being careful and cautious and saying no seven across the board, just like no three or no six. Got it. No three, no six, no seven. All right. So we're pulling out all the bisphenols and how are we doing that in our daily lives? So switching from aluminum cans to um, Tetra packs or glass is really the fastest way uh, to do that. 
And uh, if you need to use plastic, you can switch to the, the one, the two, the four, the five. Many companies have caught on. They've switched to polyethylene, which is the number one okay. uh, plastic in particular. Okay, that's a, great, that's a great call because I just had to get batteries for my podcast setup before we started at a 7-Eleven across the street. And I was looking for a water bottle for you. And there was no glass. So it's good to know that there are options. We're looking for the one if you are in a pinch, but primarily we're trying to bring stainless steel or glass water bottles with us, refilling from you know, uh, filtered water. From a planet perspective, I'll just add one thing, which is ideally we would reduce our overall plastic footprint across the board. Agreed. There's you know, fish choking out there, if, if you will. Um, there's a lot of buzz about the microplastics out there. So I want to put in a word. We're talking about not the microplastics and what we swallow. There was a study saying we have 50,000 particles of plastic in our bodies. And hey, we need to study that. But we already know that there are chemicals that aren't, mi- there aren't microplastics. They're literally, you don't see them. They're in your body. You can measure these chemicals in the urine. And they're the chemicals that are contributing to these conditions that we're talking about. So you don't, it, it's actually that not even the microplastics we have to f- freak out about. It's the, the nano or in smaller. It's just this chemical load that we're all, all walking around Our with. Our body burden. Right, your body burden. And you're seeing in your research that this body burden is connected to all kinds of things from diabetes, insulin resistance, fertility issues, you name it. That's where the evidence is really accelerated. We used to think it was only chemicals affecting the brains of kids. But now we know that chemicals literally make us fatter. There are 50 or so chemical obesogens. We've already talked about bisphenol A, but I'll give you another example. There are these forever chemicals, the perfluoroalkyl substances, the mouthful. People call them PFAS. What What was that? (laughs) PFAS. That works for me. There you go. So these are nonstick chemicals. They're used in pans. They're used in oil and water resistant. Yes. Okay. Those nonstick pans, we need to throw those out, ladies. And uh, oil and water resistant clothing uh, tends to have them, which makes me feel a little uncomfortable as a runner because it's hard to tease that out, uh, though they're working on it. Um, but the, re- the reason I bring this up is that these chemicals literally turn the body's m- metabolism the, the, the wrong way, literally turning the thermostat the wrong way. So imagine a cold day and you want the heat on. These chemicals are telling you, no, 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 don't burn any fuel and keep that as fat. There was a study in which folks had successfully lost weight. They measured the levels of PFAS after they'd lost the weight. The ones that gained the most weight back had the highest levels of PFAS. What are the best ways to, to detox PFAS from the body? I'm not a big fan of detoxing, yeah, uh, period. Um, there are, first of all, uh, hazards associated with the things you use to detox, and they've not been studied well enough. Where the best offense is the prevent offense, if you will. Limit your exposure, take these safe and simple steps. And here's the great news. There are short, medium, and long-term benefits to preventing exposure. So the phthalates are among those chemicals that are associated with the new car smell, if you will. So you might actually notice uh, if you're not using a cosmetic or a perfume that has these phthalates anymore, you might actually feel less upper respiratory symptoms in a few days. Your hormone levels might change in a good way in a couple of weeks. And then in a few months, you might see changes in your chronic disease profile. So there are these short, medium, and long-term benefits associated with prevention. Wow. Okay, so let's get into the PFAS category and how people can remove PFAS chemicals from their life. Where are they most prevalent and what swap options do we have? So the biggest step is swapping out cookware, Um, going from nonstick pans to cast iron and stainless steel. It's a little extra work, I'm going to acknowledge. A little bit of uh, good olive oil, if you will, to uh, make it a a nice uh, surface for your food to cook might be a little bit harder to to wash in the end. Um, but I personally am a big fan of the cast iron as well. And it's going old school, but it works fine. A little heavier, but yeah. that's about it. Yeah. Well, how are you feeling about all the ceramic pots and pans? So the ones that 
check to make sure there aren't lead contamination. I mean, these are pottery-based uh, materials and pottery literally comes from our earth and our earth has heavy metals that are concerned. So uh, lead is the one where people are really keen on and the paint is the other source you got to watch out for because there are some countries in the world that still use lead and paint. But if you check with the company to make sure how it's made, you're in good shape in that respect. And you're not facing some of these other synthetic chemical concerns that we're talking about. Okay, great. So I registered for stainless steel all clad when I got married in 2012. So I'll, I'll hold on to all of those. Yeah, I have a couple of cast iron pans as well, seasoned to perfection. But, I, but I've been loving my ceramic caraway pans. And I think we talked about that before yep. the show started. I used to have a green pan as well. So I'm going to I'm going to dig a little deeper and make sure that they're good but I love the other options cuz I think you know what people are looking for is something that cooks easily especially if they're just a home chef that non-stick with eggs is real easy but right. we don't want those chemicals truth and just to add one pitch I know it sounds annoying to do but a quick call to the company doesn't have to take forever Oh no, that's two seconds. Yeah. I know the owners of Caraway. So right. that's great. That'll be no no time at all. Exactly. And and I encourage folks out there who are listening to ask questions. Um, a good company is going to know what's in their products. Or if they don't know, they're sure as heck gonna find out because they want to satisfy you, the consumer. Right. How are you as a runner making sure that you're not coming in contact with that stuff? So it's about essential versus not essential use. So if it's essential for some reason, um, if I, I don't have any alternative, then I will use it and I will reuse it. Um, and that's really also important to emphasize. We've got a reality out there that, you know, every race you go to, you get this plastic bag um, New York City just changed the rules now. So now the New York Roadrunners Club is taking the step of reusing their plastic bags. Good for them. And I hope other uh, running clubs do the same and races do the same. Um, there's a lot more awareness to it now. I'm less worried about the polyethylene plastic-based materials with respect to what they gets in your skin in that respect. The concern about the the plastic is more directly related to to what you eat or or drink. So, I'm not saying don't use these these plastic materials. And I am working hard to educate people and get the companies to think about changing the nonstick, the oil repellency aspect to their to their clothing. It's almost over engineering at some level. You don't need oil repellency. We don't. It's sweat and water, essentially, that we need. And these chemicals are almost too good for the purpose that they're out there, which brings me back to what's essential versus what's not essential in terms of the way products are designed. Got it. So let's get into what we put on our body because in our body and on our body, I think... That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And as a female, um, before I got pregnant, few years before I got pregnant, I started to clean out my medicine cabinet and my makeup drawer and my personal care products. And I used the EWG and Think Dirty apps to, you know, scanning things. And as they ran out, exchanging them and trading in for really simple products. Right. I feel amazing because I, you, I'm a minimalist in my, in my bathroom. But what are people coming in contact with? What should they be aware of? And are there any easy ways to understand how to avoid phthalates. So if you don't have the app handy, there are two words to keep in mind. We've already talked about phthalates. So phthalates are a bit of a two for one here. There are different type of phthalate, but it's the same base word and the same chemistry. Um, the cosmetic ones actually tend to be more uh, antagonizing to the male sex hormone in particular with implications both for men and for women. But the word fragrance is my least favorite word in the dictionary uh, of the, the chemical label for uh, cosmetics because fragrance is a classic trade industry loophole. You don't know what's going in because you can say, well, we think it's safe. And you can simply use it without the Food and Drug Administration having any authority to say, hey, now wait a minute, what's in that and what's it doing? What do we have from toxicology and other studies? So 
in general, if you have the word fragrance on there, I would shy away uh, across the board. That's such a good tip. Um, how do you feel about essential oils if they're listed on a product? This is a, as a fragrance. This is a tricky space. Um, their essential oils seem good in first principle, but they actually have their own effects and hormonal effects to boot. I'm not one of these people that says natural is all safe. That's just not based in the science. This is again where you have to rely on Environmental Working Group and some of the leading companies in in the space. Um, I don't endorse particular brands uh, in things like this, but there are some really compelling companies that are really testing their materials um, in all sorts of ways and trying to be leaders, even when some of the companies are dragging their feet. Absolutely. You know, I think it's really hard sometimes to find things fragrance-free in the, in in body care products and in beauty products. I mean, I think they think it's a luxury to yep. add their own scent. And you're like, mm, I know what that's what company that's coming from now. But right. I actually just made a, a very small, very small investment in a personal care company called Hume mm. because they were coming out with a clean fragrance-free deodorant. And I have not been able to find one in a stick form that's commercial that'll be available at places like Target. So yep. I, I think when we are asking for things, people are starting to listen. Yes. And especially if they've be, you know, if they become newly become parents or are in contact with or starting to understand what kind of a burden their baby already has in utero. Can we can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And how that how these chemicals are affecting children. Yeah. So um, there are two ways I want to go. So I want to let's get back to that uh, power of the purse at some point. Okay. But well, we can go back to the power of the purse, and then we'll go to kids. I just am so excited to interview. No, you. let's talk about I'm kids. Swirling. I'm a pediatrician, after all. <laughs> yeah. So the evidence is strongest that uh, pesticides and flame retardants mess with thyroid hormone. Now we already talked about thyroid hormone earlier, but um, you may uh, remember with your little one. Uh, we checked, uh, you, you had your baby's uh, heel pricked mm -hmm. uh, for uh, thyroid hormone. And that's because neonatal hypothyroidism or congenital hypothyroidism is eminently treatable. If you pick it up and you treat it, you prevent a child from having a lifetime of intellectual disability. We used to think that was the only way you could have a problem with thyroid hormone. Now we know in pregnancy, Thyroid hormone is as important because mom makes thyroid hormone for baby up until about the second trimester. And without sufficient thyroid hormone function, that baby's brain doesn't develop the right way. And what little we know about um, pesticides and flame retardants is that within the clinically normal range, that is, I can't check which mom's in trouble. I can't even treat that mom because you can over-treat thyroid too and cause other problems. It's a finely tuned violin kind of problem. But if within that clinically normal range, even subtle effects of these chemicals on thyroid hormone can induce cognitive deficits and even attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and autism. So we're talking about not just an IQ point here or an IQ point there. We're talking about things that are permanent and lifelong disabilities. And I'm just going to make a, a pitch for a moment for thinking about what an IQ point means across the population. So if one child comes back from school with one less IQ point, no offense, you might not notice, I might not notice, the school teacher might not notice. But if 100,000 children come back with one or two less IQ points, the entire economy notices. Each IQ point is roughly worth 2% of a kid's lifetime economic productivity. On average, million dollars a year is in a child's lifetime economic productivity. 2% is $20,000. You multiply that by 4 million kids born each year, you're getting a lot of zeros that even get, might get people in the White House these days look turning the, turning the, turning the right way. Yeah, somebody's going to start paying attention when you put dollar signs on it. Right. And what little we know is that endocrine disrupting chemicals cost the U.S. $340 billion a year. That's 2.3% of our gross domestic product. Literally, we're uh, whacking ourselves at, uh, below the shin and hurting ourselves, hurting our economy. Because again, our kids are the turbo chargers of our economy in the long term. They're the next generation of our ability 
uh, to be the next Elon Musk's or pick uh, Bill Gates's or whoever you uh, you aspire your kids to be growing or up. Or Dr. Leo Trezonde. <laughs> <laughs> we need people like you. So take the compliment. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, that's so impactful. It's It's really, really powerful when you start putting dollar signs behind it. But it also... You think about their lives. These little these little malleable human beings that are just so innocent and pure. <laughs> and you can't rewire a child's brain. You can't um, redo a child's lung development. All these organs are setting into motion. And that science of epigenetics I talked about earlier is an imprint that literally tells the whole body across uh, various organs what to do for decades. So these little things do matter. What in regards to fertility and pregnancy can we do to have the best outcomes for our our babies? It goes back to those safe and simple steps I talk about. Not microwaving plastic, not machine dishwashing plastic, avoiding canned food consumption, recirculating that air, wash uh, using a wet mop. Um, eating, we haven't talked about eating organic yet. Yeah, let's do that. So eating organic 10 years ago, I work at Bellevue Hospital, which is the flagship of the New York City public hospital system. And 10 years ago, people would look at me like I was nuts if I brought up eating organic because the price margins were so big. But now with the market share exploding as people are taking attention to eating organic, you're seeing that price margin narrow such that now the big box stores are putting the organic side by side with the conventional and just to say one thing, because there's a little bit of a price difference still, there are these priority fruits and vegetables. So if resources are tight, it's about avoiding the leafy greens and vegetables uh, when it comes to those conventional brands. Eat organic for those above all, because the pesticides are sprayed onto that outer layer and you're literally eating that outer layer. An avocado might not be as big a deal, but something like spinach or uh, uh, peas or, or something like that, where you're literally eating that outer layer, it really goes a long way. And study after study, low income as well as high income population, kids as well as adults, has shown that in two to three days, you switch to organic, you drop the uh, level of pesticides measurable in urine uh, instantaneously. So this is something- There's some that, payoff there. Right away. Wow. What, um, so when it comes, that's something I've told clients before, where if, it, if you're, you have a peel, right. if you can't remember the clean 15 and the dirty dozen and you don't want to look it up every year, if it has a peel and you can peel it off, maybe you can get away with the conventional. That's but if right. there's more surface area and you're eating the entire thing, organic is the way to go. Totally. Should we be concerned about organic pesticides? So there are pesticides used in organic agriculture. Don't get me wrong. And um, I'm so glad you brought this up because that's usually the industry response. And yes, they they are they have their own uh, toxic effects. But in terms of what we know from the science about the effects of those pesticides that are on the list of allowable uses for organic, and by the way, it's very low use to begin with because there are all these technical, mechanical water irrigation steps that are taken to reduce the exposure to boot. If you compare the toxicity of those, the toxicity of the, or of the carbon-based pesticides that we're talking about, the organophosphate pesticides that have gotten a lot of attention. Like glyphosate. News. Well, glyphosate's a different category and we'll get there okay. uh, in a second. But the, uh, this is chlorpyrifos, which was in the news because the Environmental Protection Agency decided not to ban it. You can imagine there were some industry interests at play in that respect, among other categories. So let's, let's talk about glyphosate for a minute because it's gotten a lot of buzz. There are not a lot of studies about glyphosate, but here's the deal. You eat organic, you automatically cannot be GMO. Glyphosate is an herbicide that is added to GMO corn and soy and other materials in genetically modified food that was already engineered so that weeds would die and not the, the uh, food would die. So when you're getting it, here's the great news. You're getting a two for one deal when you eat organic. You're avoiding GMOs to begin with. Um, so 
And, and the science has to catch up in a lot of places. I'm not suggesting that the jury is in fully on, on glyphosate. We're seeing the lawsuits. We're seeing other attention uh, in some of the a- applicators and other settings. Uh, but there's enough science for a whole bunch of other pesticides that are known to be more toxic that I suggest we focus there and, and let the science catch up. Good to know. Glyphosate seems to be the poster child for pesticides. So let's focus on where the science is with you. Yes. What category should we be avoiding and um, what are they doing to the body? So in particular, the science is strongest for the organophosphate pesticides. There's emerging science about the pyrethroids or another commonly used form of pesticide. Let's not forget that some people are still spraying in their homes for unwanted creatures and critters. And that's not usually necessary. There are integrated pest management methods that can mitigate that use. And when you think about lawn care, that's the other hot area. You see Roundup and other materials all around. Um, We have to take a step back that 50, 60 years ago, we didn't have those techniques and we still had great lawns. So there are techniques out there And from a cost perspective, here's the scary part. There's a study done comparing, this is in uh, lawn care for golf courses, mind you, so larger scale, but they could quantify the economic benefits. The cost of organic lawn care was cheaper in the long view, despite the human cost, because you actually have to do more work, don't get me wrong, and employs people. But think about that for a minute. I would feel better employing somebody to do a job, especially if it's cheaper, than employing a chemical uh, that might have long-term consequences, not just for the workers using it, but for the people playing on it. Absolutely. So what, I mean, I had a, I actually had a farmer on talking about biodynamic farming a few episodes ago, talking about all the ways that we can use nature to get rid of pests and bugs. When you talk, when we're talking about home care and taking care of our home, whether you know we're, we're, people are spraying or tenting their homes. Do you have any advice when it comes to preventing those pests or what, what the listeners can do if someone tells them, oh, you have to tent your home or you have ants or something like that? There are um, a couple of basic core steps. Now, I'm not a pest control expert <laughs> in the figured. least. I've got enough on my plate as yeah. it is. Uh, doing pediatrics and and doing research. But the basic biology is that if you put food sources or decaying food or whatever, you put something attractive for an ant or some other unwanted creature to come by, they're going to want to come by. So the key is really... Cleanliness. Cleanliness and keeping things separate. And that can go a long way. It's not not that easy in the first couple of days, but after after a play, just get used to the the way to do it. <laughs> Got it. So you've mentioned a number of times testing urine and and getting chemicals, understanding how your toxic burden by testing urine. If I wanted to understand what was going on in my body and what my burden was, my chemical burden, where would I go? Where would I start? And and what do you recommend in tracking that over the long run? So this is still in the world of research rather than clinical care. And here are a couple of reasons why. It's expensive to get done. Second, everything I've told you during this conversation is what I would tell you if I had a list of chemicals with all the numbers and your results. So we don't need to nerd out about all all your chemical body burden. I know what you've got based on national survey data in general and based on what you would tell me. And you probably have lower levels because you do a lot of the right things already that you've talked about. And if you wanted to go further, you could do the things that we we talked about and, and focus on other places where maybe you don't have as much control. Um, and we don't have control over every environment. We have our, our workplaces, our schools, our daycare centers, our subways, our buses. There are all sorts of places out there where these chemicals are applied without our knowledge and consent often. And we're exposed uh, through those pathways. So that's the call to action part of the book and this message. And that if we all rise up and raise attention and just ask a bit of a nosy question here and there saying, hey, what, what cleaning products are you using in my kids' schools? 
that can go a long way in helping all of us limit our exposures. Because I'm sure those teachers and those folks who are doing the cleaning don't want to have effects either. Right. So let's get back to the medicine cabinet and, and all the beauty products. What advice do you have for someone, woman or male, trying to clean up their personal care products? So I would open up the cabinet, bust out. EWG's got a good app. There are other apps out there. And I would look for those two words, phthalate and fragrance. And I'd pull all those out that have those first. I would look at the uh, the scoring system and I would think also about what's essential and what's not essential. I mean, really, when you think about most people's cabinets, no offense, myself included, I'm, I'm guilty as charged. We add a few things, we get something, maybe we get pick up something at a hotel, pop it away, like, oh, that's that's cool and just stays there for a while. We use it occasionally and it may not be the safest material under the sun. Got it. So pack your pack your personal care products when you go on vacation. Do not use the hotel minis. I'm sure they're the biggest culprits of of chemicals. They're a driver of pla- of the plastic footprint as well. Yes, they are. They're they're getting another two for one here. Yes. (laughs) So I think for the last few minutes of the show, I'd love to understand a little bit more about your research in regards to the chemical load and disease states that you're seeing in your practice um, or in, in our country. So as a pediatrician, I mostly focus on moms and kids, though I'm interested in in the impacts on all of us and dads too, for those of you listening. And so what you do typically is to uh, recruit uh, pregnant women or ideally couples that are trying to conceive because there's a lot of exposures that are happening. You were already alluding to that before conception or uh, before the, uh, the stick changes color that um, are impactful. And that can often be where the embryo is dividing and developing and can be exquisitely sensitive. We typically think of that 20-week ultrasound and that, and that little forming baby developing at that point. But things are happening much, much more before that too. And the, the way you do these kinds of studies is to ask questions after you consent them, of course, and get biological samples, urine and blood. And you try to follow these populations over time. We're following about 2,000 moms and kids in New York City. Uh, they're moving around all across the world. So it's hard to call them all New Yorkers anymore. But uh, we're bringing them in for visits every year, uh, following up with questions here and there, measuring their height, their weight, doing things a little more detailed than the pediatrician or other healthcare provider might do. And then we're just trying to see what relationships are associated. Because you can't run randomized control trials on people. You can't say, ah, say, ah, here's a little pesticide for you. That would not be ethical and I couldn't even do it, even if an ethical review board would dare let me do it. And um, you can't even easily design studies to reduce these exposures like randomized control trials. Like you couldn't substitute out very easily someone's diet with all organic. It's A, expensive to implement as a research design. It's easier to do it at an individual level, by the way. But Uh, For a typical study, it might be too much. And then you have to think about the control group. What do you say to that control group? You have to tell them something ethically because you are studying things that you think might be a problem. Right. I would assume that when people start working with you and 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 joining your trials and agree to be followed, that their lifestyle gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and less chemicals. We call that a Hawthorne effect. Uh, That's just... And that actually makes it harder to find things in our studies. And that's okay. I'll live with that. If people change their ways based on entering the study, we have to be conscious of it. But again, that's part of the relationship you have with research participants and that you really are making a pact that you are not first going to do no harm. And you're, you're not going to be able to easily provide much in the way of direct benefit. But if you're studying something, you're going to tell them what you're studying and why, you're, why you think it's important that they participate. So if that changes their behavior, so be it. I can live with that. Yeah. For the benefit of all. Yes. 
Flame retardants and pesticides mess with thyroid hormone and affect kids' brain development, at least showing cognitive effects, autism, and attention deficit hyperactivity. The jury is still somewhat out. Um, when it comes to obesity, um, the phthalates, the bisphenols, and those forever chemicals, the perfluoroalkyl substances are among the suspects. Uh, we're still teasing out what chemicals have the effects. Um, puberty is also another important window of exposure we haven't talked as much about. Um, and there may be effects of phthalate exposure. And let's not forget adult exposures too. The, um, those forever chemicals I talked about in multiple studies have been associated with weight gain. Uh, phthalates in adults have been associated with adult obesity and adult diabetes. Uh, when it comes to infertility, the evidence is arguably strongest for the phthalates and delaying time to pregnancy, if not propelling people into infertility. The problem there, as you can imagine, is in an ideal world, you would follow a population just from when they were born or before they were born till they were conceiving, then also somehow having followed the partner <laughs> In parallel, I mean, you can imagine like the Rubik's cube here. Yeah. Uh, the, the you know the the luck you would need unless you follow an entire city, and that's not practical. It's not feasible at all, right? Yeah. And um, but it's amazing. And here's the thing that just blows my mind: it's amazing what we find despite all the limitations. And yet we get a lot of people saying to us, well, association is not causation. You can't really say yes or no. But we have to think about the stakes involved here. Yeah. So, and none of these changes are irrevocable in our manufacturing. It just means we have to recalibrate the trade-offs between the benefits economically that certain companies get and the harm that people might be suffering as a result of that exposure. It's really just doing a proper cost-benefit analysis at some level. I mean, I'm still a pediatrician. I'm not an economist at heart, but that rebalancing is fundamentally what I'm all about. It's really being transparent about what the trade-offs are. And there might be chemicals where we might overreact, but we could always go back to that chemical and say, no, wait a minute. That might actually have been the best of all the alternatives out there. And it's all about safer alternatives. There's nothing that's ever going to be safe best for, for every use in every circumstances. After all, too much and too little water are toxic. Um, you, can, you can die either way. And that really speaks to the complexity. Um, and there's so many dimensions in, involved. So it, that'll keep me gainfully employed for a while and try to scramble to figure things out. It absolutely will. What, um, wow, I mean, it's just, it's, it's hard to think about. And I think you said it best even earlier in the interview that a lot of these chemicals we didn't have 60 years ago. What were we doing differently? And it's so amazing that that's the, the common theme throughout all of health and wellness. For whoever I interview, it's... Right. If we could just go back to the traditional ways we raised animals, the traditional ways we grew our produce, the traditional ways we took care of ourselves without pharmaceuticals, without toxic chemicals, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, right. without the hormones, without the antibiotics. I mean, it's just... Keep the smoking away and, and keep the bacon and eggs diet maybe to a minimum. Uh, there are some things that weren't better about the 50s and 60s. Don't get me right, wrong. Right, right, but right. still... But yes, there are many things that we've changed and we've presumed they were for the better. But that was based on an understanding that turned out to be flawed. And that's okay. Science catches up and makes us realize that the, the assumptions we made back in the 50s and 60s through better living through chemistry may not be all that. Yeah, no better, do better, I think is the right. is what we should be all doing. Yep. And hopefully everyone now knows how to do better thanks to you. Oh, thank you. And again, I, you know, it's a joy talking to you because for me, the power is not all going to come from the research I do. It's really that truth to power ultimately that's going to change the day. I still think of um, a study of just five packages, food packages in two major supermarket chains for these buffet style food pack food uh, collection systems. They found PFAS in five packages. Just this little teensy study 
And all of a sudden, two major supermarket chains on Facebook and Instagram were shoving their old food packaging aside. They called their upstream manufacturer. They changed their product sourcing and voila, they got rid of their PFAS in that source. That's one source. That's one step. But that's what gives me a lot of hope. I mean, sure, I can get excited about any study and what journal it comes out. And when it gets media attention, that's interesting too. But for me, the joy is seeing that change. It's action. Yeah. It's action from the knowledge that you and all the research that you're doing. What are we doing on the ground floor to make change? The, the people that really have the power are the people with the pocketbooks and wallets that can really drive change. I love that. I always say vote with your pocketbook. Wow. What a pleasure. Thank you so, so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with everyone. I am going to listen to this episode a number of times. I'll put together a checklist of all of your tips for the listeners on the blog of how they can remove endocrine disrupting chemicals in their life and really start taking charge of of pulling out chemicals because we all need to do it, especially if you're looking to get pregnant. And, you know, you just, like you said, it's not about detoxing. It's about avoiding for the long run. So that's what the goal of this podcast is today. No one should feel afraid. You should feel empowered. There are so many swaps we can all make out there. So thank you so much for being here, Leo. Where can people find you? LeoTrasande.com or SickerFatterPorer.com. Definitely. If you haven't read the book, Um, You can read it. You can listen to it on Audible. It is out there in the world making change every single day and it can further your knowledge from what you learned today on the podcast. So thanks for joining guys and we'll be back next week with another exciting guest. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at BeWellByKelly.com and follow me on Instagram at BeWellByKelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 